I think one of the most incredible challenges there is in the world, one of the biggest struggles that I face every day in my personal life is dealing with you. <laughs> no, really. One of the hardest things that I find in my life, and has always been, dealing with you. You see, you're probably a born-again Christian. You probably have a personal relationship with God in some type. You probably are walking with God at some point in time in your life. You have certain ideas that you picked up along the way, certain kind of quirky attitudes and actions that you treat other people with. I see them, and you know, I don't comment. I don't say anything to you directly. I try to take it to prayer. I try to change my attitude and my actions inside because I know that unless I do, without being forgiving, without being merciful, without being graceful, then I would come under the same condemnation that I feel towards you and what you're doing. Because you see, I don't have a problem with discernment. I have a problem with what to do after discernment has happened. Now, maybe you find yourself in that same position. Maybe you see the hypocrisy around you, how sometimes you can see a pastor or an elder, a deacon, a minister, someone who you thought you looked up to as being a man of God, doing something that only the ungodly would do. Maybe you have seen them sin. Maybe you've seen them fall from grace. Maybe you've seen them stumble. Or maybe you're in the middle of it and you don't know what to do. And then you want to judge them accordingly. Well, God says you can't. Because, you see, there's a time and a place that you have to allow God to work. Because God never came into the world to condemn the world. To be perfectly blunt, the world can condemn itself without God needing to condemn it at all. Everything that the world does is pretty much self-condemnation. I mean... You don't have to look or scratch very hard beneath the surface of any actions of worldly people to see what their base motivation is. And it's usually pretty selfish. So all of us, Christians especially, we're very much guilty of this desire and want to look at and find fault with each other because it really is a perverse, backwards attitude. That isn't something that's godly, but it is the nature of, quite frankly, warning in Christians to do. Because from that critical spirit, from that fault finding, comes all kinds of things. Gossip and slander and malice and wrath. All kinds of fleshy attitudes. Pride, ego, inflated idealisms, theologies that are false, perverse actions. All of it comes flooding in because the one thing that Satan does is that he doesn't come in to destroy something. He comes in to trip something. And then he lets it happen around other believers and they can do his work for him. Because we're not so good in the restoration part, but we are good in the condemnation arena. We know how to put the thumbs down rather than put the thumbs up. Whenever we see, supposedly, as the scripture says, a brother or sister in the fall, then we're supposed to go to them in private, you know, to minister to them, you know, in private, to try to get them to understand where we're coming from. We're never told how to approach that subject. And 
the one thing that I see a failure of, because I have seen that work accurately, is that the person who's seeking to go to that person usually hasn't quite cleared it up in their own mind and conscience yet. Because whenever you see someone in a fault, you may find the fault in yourself. So one of the questions that I always ask myself, because believe me, the hardest thing in my Christian walk, the greatest struggle I have, the biggest stumbling block that I see in front of me always is <laughs> another Christian. I don't have any problem loving the ungodly. I don't have any problem loving the terrorist or the, the people who don't know Jesus or the Muslim or the Jehovah's Witness or people that obviously are acting according to the ways of the world because that's what they normally do. That's their normal attitude and action. What really gets my goat is the hypocrisy of who we are when we don't do what God wants us to and we then go out and portray what God didn't want us to. That always stumbles me and I have to wrestle with it daily. As a matter of fact, it happens pretty regularly. It's even happening now or all around me. And when I come to that place, I have to go to God and get in his face, literally, and, and have him stop me because my, my flesh wants to go and do and be. And yet my spirit says, no, the mercy that I've received, I too must extend and pray for. Because you see, there's kind of a backwards way of looking at things that you can either do it one of two ways. You can either look at it as, well, if you let God be the judge, he may judge a lot harsher than we would. And wow, how much harsher would be his judgment than ours? And that's kind of like the wrong way to look at it. But that is one way. You could give a cup of cold water to an enemy and heap fiery coals upon their head, Proverbs teaches us. You can allow for the time that you pray and let the Holy Spirit interpret your prayers, but at the same time, bringing attention to the aggravation you're feeling, God will move in a more powerful way. But you see, that's only one side of the coin. Man looks on the outward things. God looks on the heart. When I say that, most of you are thinking, well, yeah, okay, so God looks on the heart. But having looked on the heart, he can see that the heart is deceitful, wickedly made, and perverse above all things, that out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks. So I've, I've looked at the situation. I see the hypocrisy. I, I need to intervene. No, God looks on both hearts. He looks on your heart, and he looks on my heart. Because often I have to remove myself and stand way back, because I know what my heart is full of. My first reaction is not my best reaction. So I go out of my way to plead with the Holy Spirit, to ask God to change my heart, to search me and see if there be any wicked way in me, to observe my attitudes as they are wrong, and I always know they are, as I try to work through the circumstance and change my attitude before I could ever deal with the situation that is presented in front of me. Now, whenever I have had to go to the person, I have always been brought through that process before I ever went to the person. And by the time I did, what may have been Satan wanting to trip me up in my attitude and actions and sharing with that person, God used for his glory to minister to them because I've had to, at times in my life, confront or be confronted by men in charge, men of God, people that were wrong and doing wrong, but were embarrassed by the fact that someone could see that they were doing wrong. And so when confronted, you can't deal with the issue on the surface. You have to recognize God is the one who deals with the heart. You don't. You always pray that the grace of God, the mercy of God, the forgiveness of God be extended and that the Holy Spirit work on the person to convict because that's not our job. 
We can't play Holy Spirit. We can't play convictor of sin. We can't judge our brothers. As a matter of fact, we're called to love our brothers, and that's why I said, you know, <laughs> the biggest struggle in my life is, quite frankly, you. <laughs> and it really is, because when you're, you know, gaga and go-go and good -go about loving the Lord your God, then I perfectly accept what you do. You know, and it's like, oh, so easy to do. But then, when I see the contradictions of sin, the hypocrisy, or some way of like being challenged by not doing the right thing, but going out of your way to do the wrong thing, then it presents to me a dilemma. And quite frankly, puts me in a tough spot. But you see, that's where we get to step back. We get to remove ourselves. We get to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Because walking in the spirit means that there's more happening in the spiritual dimension than there is in the physical reality of you saying, doing, or being something you're not. That's the beauty of what the Holy Spirit is. He can go inside of a person and deal with the root issues that you can't see in the heart of man. I myself have always had to step back to ask God to do what I cannot do, to intervene where I cannot go, to speak the words that I cannot say, because I know that if I did, I would destroy the work of God that he's doing in a person's life. Sometimes you'll find that, according to Proverbs, when you find your brother in a sin, you don't go in with them and participate in it. You step back and let them do their folly and fall into the pit of their own making. You remove yourself so that when they need you, when they are broken, when they are down from that separation they've created between themselves and God, then you can restore that person with the joy of the Lord, the love you have for them, and the peace that passes all understanding that you can present to them that you've known all along what the attitude was, you've known what the action was, you've known what the sin was, you dealt with it in your own life, you recognize that in you you would have done the same thing so that you could reach across and minister the grace of God. Because we're given grace for grace. We're not given grace so that we could go out and condemn because Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, but that through him the world might find salvation. The question is, with you, what do people find from your words and intentions? Because in my life, I know I have been so capable of seeing through all the contentions in the world of what they try to present as fact and truth and bamboozle and lies and all the manipulations that men do. And knowing that, you can't become cynical. Knowing that, you can't become bitter. Knowing that, I can't become less than the son of man who would restore and heal the hurt that a person has come to such desperation that they would turn their back on God, even though it would be a Christian, and do something that they're involved in that's wrong and not right. And that, Tozer seems to understand this deception that comes with looking at the circumstances and not aware of the spirit behind it. Because I know, just like you, I can be a critical spirit. I could change immediately from that spirit of peace, love, and joy, and mercy to critical criticism, righteousness, and self-righteousness very easily. And it's not that hard to do for you or me. Growing love for our fellow Christians. By this means shall all men know that you are my disciples and that you have love for one another. 
It's interesting that Jesus said that in John. By this shall they know that you are my disciples indeed, in that you have love for one another. Now Jesus took these 12 men, and 11 since one failed, and became the betrayer of the brethren. But in these 12 men, you found people that started off hating each other physically. They could not stand the sight of each other. They were very Jewish and passionate in their devotion and obsession to certain boundaries that they would not cross. And sometimes you'll read a book that may give you a better example of that, of why they would not go through certain portions of the country, even though it was a shortcut straight through to Jerusalem. They wouldn't go through Samaria, you know, and they wouldn't deal with the Samaritans because they were, after all, inbred or bred with Gentiles of all things and couldn't deal with that. Or God knows that one of the disciples himself had become a, a perverted Jew. He had become one of those compromisers. He had compromised his life and become a tax collector, he was a partier, was one of those Gentile-style living people that was very ungodly and disgusting and immoral. And we had fishermen who were drunks because fishermen did drink, just like any fisherman will tell you. Yes, you work hard, you drink hard, you play hard. So we have a wide variety of society. If you look at each one, manifested and revealed in the 12. And in that, it's amazing to see that Jesus uses this statement to sum up who are his disciples in that you have love for one another. I myself have personally been challenged in every venue you can imagine, from riches to wealth to prosperity to poverty. And I used to say, because for the longest time it was true, that the only thing that stumbled me was prosperity because I couldn't stand the prosperous. And this was for like maybe 20 years of my life as a Christian and, and in ministry that the prosperous were always the ones that I found great struggles to understand, comprehend, and have extended mercy towards until God took me into that arena of the people who are quote unquote prosperous. And I worked for them, lived with them, dealt with them, and even had participated in their wealth at one time in my life. And in that, I found how to overcome in my life my bias, my prejudice against prosperity. I don't have that issue because the person in a prosperous circle has the same issues as the person in a poverty circle. The reality is it's still a hard issue. It's something that the Holy Spirit can reveal to you, but only He can show you what the person is really like. And that's what is hard about a judgmental, critical spirit. Except the Holy Spirit reveal the heart, you have no idea what the person is like. Because again, you're only dealing with the surface issue, you're only dealing with the surface attitude, and you're only dealing with the outward things and not the inward. Sometimes an earnest Christian will, after some remarkable spiritual encounter, withdraw himself from his fellow believers and develop a spirit of fault finding. More often than not, you're going to see that on places and in things like oh, the internet or social media that technically, on the one hand, appears to be social, but is sometimes counterproductive towards developing relationships with people. Because you see, as iron sharpens iron, so too brother sharpens brother face to face. In other words, you were meant to be social. You were meant to be socializing. You were meant to rub off on each other. You were meant to be conflicted with some of the things that your brother might do so that you would learn to get along. You're meant to play in the sandbox together. It sounds a little strange, but it's true. You were meant to serve one another. You're meant to love one another. You're meant to prefer one another as greater than yourself. Not to be saying that you're serving your brother by the ministry and pretending that the ministry is serving your brother. It's not. 
ministry is very self-serving and self-satisfying because God manifests himself in that ministry and you are blessed because God is using you. So it's a very selfish, self-centered way of receiving a blessing to be able to share that truth with others, but it's not serving your brother. The ministry has never been that. The ministry is one where you take physically yourself and lay your life down for your brother, where you go and wash their feet, where you go and heal their broken heart, where you go and give them of your sustenance in your life, the very physical manifestation of Jesus to them. This is the dangerous state of mind, and the more dangerous because it can justify itself by the facts. It may be easily true that the professed Christian with whom he is acquainted is worldly and dull and without spiritual enthusiasm or has committed some grave sin. It is not that he is mistaken in his facts that proves to be an error, but that his reaction to the flat facts is of the flesh. See, every fact Every law, the law, will condemn us. The facts of the reality of our actions are caused by a being that is living inside of a fallen nature, our flesh, that is inside of a corrupted body, our physical appearance, that is always able to fall regularly in a day. A righteous man falls seven times and rises up again that we have that tendency to be sinners. But we are sinners saved by grace. It's his mercy that causes us to repent. It's his love that causes us to ask forgiveness. It's his forgiveness that causes the grace we receive to be able to share with others. We are the ones who need the mercy, grace, and forgiveness. Because we could be right and at the same time be wrong in how we apply that rightness or righteousness in the way that the action may have been, but we don't know how God will work it out in the end. He may use that person's sin to bring them to repentance, and we would be standing in the middle. This new spirituality is made of less charitable or loving, and we must be cautioned that any religious experience that fails to deepen our love for our fellow Christians may be safely written off as spurious. It is not what God intended for us to have, but that we should grow in the love of God and the fruit of his spirit. The Apostle John makes love for our fellow Christians to be a true test of true faith. Insisting that as we grow in grace, we grow in love toward all of God's people. Everyone that loveth him that begat, everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. In other words, 1 John 5 1. Everyone that God has caused to come into the kingdom, <laughs> everyone that begat, it's kind of a neat way of saying it because I love sometimes the King James. For everyone that loveth him that begat, loveth him also that is begotten of him. In other words, because God saved them, then if we are saved, then we love them that are saved. But you could also reverse that and say, if you love not, then you are not saved. And that's where a big criteria comes. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And we have to come to that conclusion where we overcome our critical spirit, which could stymie our Christian life and prove that we may have fallen from the grace of God. But to overcome that, we have to go back to the place of forgiveness from God to God, restore ourselves in right relationship with God before we can ever have the love to be shed abroad in our hearts for our brethren. So you must love because love covers a multitude of sins. Therefore, we conclude that whenever Whatever tends to separate us in person or in heart from our fellow Christians is not of God, but is of the flesh or of the devil. Conversely, whatever causes us to love the children of God more is likely to be of God. So you see, 
you are my biggest challenge, but you're also my biggest blessing. Because as I'm able to overcome myself and love you more, then I demonstrate in my love the greater reality of my relationship with God that overcomes the world and the enemy that restores in right relationship the two of us that we lift each other up to God Almighty that he would bless us and we would be the light, the very brightness of the glory of God manifesting in the flesh. The very Jesus himself in you, Jesus, 